had found the body at Pillow and wanted me to go and identify the body, which I did. And we found the body with, with didn't have on any clothes at all. The body was so badly damaged that we couldn't hardly just tell who he was. But he happened to have on a ring with his initials, and that cleared it up. I was at home, and Mo Wright called me and said they, they done found the body. And uh, I want to go down there to identify his body. And I carried him down there. And when I carried him down there, the smell was so bad till I got about five or six feet from the body. And Mo Wright went up there and pulled his ring off and said, that's him. And then Mo Wright said his tongue been cut and pushed back in his mouth. And his private had been cut off. When I heard that Emmett had been found and had been murdered, everybody just fell to pieces. Well, there was uh, shock, sadness, anger, and almost unbelief, you know. But uh, it was a strange feeling, strange feeling. By now, everybody is in a, they're screaming, they're falling out. And I ran over to try to help my mother, and I felt such a vibration coming from her to me until I jumped back because it seemed that I was going to take her life away from her. It seemed that her life was draining into me, and I could feel myself building up, getting strong enough to carry on. Cher Strider wanted an immediate burial because he knew that it wouldn't be good for the state of Mississippi for people to see what had happened to Emmett Till. And uh, the only way you could stop people from seeing was to bury it, I mean, get it out of sight. I don't know what authority he had to bury my son, but he took that authority. We were told to uh, meet at the church. We're going to have a funeral today. We're going to bury the body. We all went to the church that day. The grave was dug. The body was there in a pine box. It had an awful stench to it. It was getting ready to put the body in the ground when we got word to stop the burial. Oh my God. Number one, when I first saw that box, I just collapsed. That box seemed to me to be as big, bigger than anything I'd ever seen before. But that was just the beginning. The size of the box was really the easy part. When I discovered that the box could not be opened, then I wondered what on earth in the world is going on? You mean to tell me that I have spent all of this money to get a body that I can't even look at? How do I know what's in the box? I said, Mr. Rayner, do you have a hammer? He said, what do you mean? He said, yes, I have a hammer. I said, I mean, if you can't open the box, I can. And I'm going in the box. All right. He said, Miss Bradley, if you're that determined, I want you to go home and relax. He said, I'll go in the box and I will call you when I get, when I take the body out of the box. And when I, 
I was satisfied with that. I had to see, though, what was in there. And when I got back to when he called me and I came back to the funeral home, about three blocks away, an odor met me that nearly knocked me out. I said, what on earth in the world is that? It was Emmett's body. That's how the smell was so uh, strong until it covered a two or three block area. My father was on one side of me and Rayfield Moody was on the other side of me and Jean was at my back. And I shrugged them, I said, turn me loose. I've got a job to do. And I don't have time to be fainting now. I saw his tongue had been choked out and it was lying down on his chin. I saw that uh, this eye was out and it was lying about midway the cheek. I looked at this eye and it was gone. I looked at the bridge of his nose and it looked like someone had taken a meat chopper and chopped it. And I looked at his teeth because I took so much pride in his teeth. His teeth were the prettiest things I'd ever seen in my life, I thought. And uh, I only saw two. Who were the rest of them? They'd just been knocked out. And uh, I was looking at his ears. His ears uh, were like mine. They curled, they're, they're not attached, and they curled up uh, the same way mine are. And I didn't see the ear. Where's the ear? And that's when I discovered a hole about here, and I could see daylight on the other side. I said, now, was it necessary to shoot it? If that's a bullet hole, was that necessary? And I also discovered that they had taken an ax and they had gone straight down across his head and the face and the back of the head were separate. I looked at Mr. Rayner, and Mr. Rayner wanted to know, was I going to have the casket opened? I said, oh, yes, we're going to open the casket. He said, well, Miss Bradley, do you want me to uh, do something for the face? You want me to try to fix it up. I said, no, let the people see what I've seen. I said, I want the world to see this because there's no way I could tell this story and give them the visual picture of what my son looked like. The easiest thing would have been to say, no, close the casket, I can't bear it. But she somewhere found the strength to say, I'll bear my pain to save some other mother from having to go through this. And because she put the, the picture of this young man's body on the conscience of America, she might have saved thousands of young black men and young black women's lives. I believe that the whole United States is mourning with me. And that the death of my son can mean something to the other unfortunate people all over the world, then for him to have died a hero would mean more to me than for him just to have died.
tried to get into the church to have the funeral was nearly mission impossible. I had to address the crowd on the way in and assure them that they would be able to hear the funeral services. And when we had finished, we would leave and the church would be open for them to continue to view the body. I went to the funeral, I saw the body, I am it, and I, it's like it wasn't him, you know. I can't explain it. It was like this is not Emmett, you know. So I didn't feel any sorrow, you know, because in, inside I'm going to see him again, you know. That's the way I felt. That's not Emmett. People sort of can deal with things they don't have to look at, but it's hard to view a corpse and turn your head. And it was like in your face, you're going to deal with this this time. And that's why Generations Unborn owe uh, Ms. Mobley a lot because she was able to graphically bring home what a thousand speeches couldn't bring home. She made America deal with its ugly racial problem. with Mrs. Bryant, and I want to see Mrs. Bryant punished, her husband, and any other persons that were in on this thing, and I feel like the... To the President of the United States, Mr. Dwight D. Eisenhower, White House, Washington, D.C. Honorable Sir, we the undersigned women and mothers and members of District 1, UPWACIO, call upon you, President of the United States, and your Congress to enact federal anti-lynch anti and anti-poll tax legislation immediately. 